Hi, everyone. I'm here today with Tad Hargrave, and I'm really excited to, to be here with him for us to talk about niching and why that is essential and, um, and how we can go about niching more thoughtfully. And um, Tad, I'm just going to first say hi to you, Tad. It's good to have you here. Good to be here. Yeah. Um, so Tad and I are here with some of my clients because Tad is going to be actually doing some live coaching with my clients on, on their niches. So you'll get to see from these examples how you might want to phrase and create or clarify your niche. And um, just a few words about Tad. Um, I think a lot of you watching this may have heard about Tad Hargrave and Marketing for Hippies. If you have not, be sure to check out his website. Uh, he has hundreds of blog posts on there and videos as well. And he really kind of inspired me a couple years ago to get started with, with writing and doing content because before, before a couple years ago, I wasn't doing any writing at all. Um, so uh, check it out. His website is marketing for F O R hippies, H I P P I E S, just like it sounds marketing for hippies.com. And Tad has been uh, basically helping people clarify their niche for years and he has created uh, a book about it. He has created an online course. So we will be sure to talk about that later because I think that um, it's a really affordable way to work with Tad on clarifying your niche as well. So um, there's a lot we, we're going to talk about. So without further ado, welcome Tad. And uh, maybe you can start by telling us what a, what a niche is. I think everyone watching this has some, some idea of what a niche is, but maybe, you know, maybe not, but tell us what you, what, how you describe it. Well, it, first of all, it's, it's just a really important thing in business. Uh, you know, what, years ago when I first started doing the marketing coaching, I didn't really get how important niche was. I had gotten in Jay Abraham stuff, and he didn't really seem to talk about target market or niche quite so much. And So I, I knew and focused on a lot of the tactics, but it became so apparent really early on that if you didn't have the niche figured out, nothing else seemed to work, where everything else was so much harder. And uh, as soon as the niche would get figured out, I would have ideas. Everyone in the workshop would have ideas for the person. So it was just one of those things that appeared over time. Uh, you know, I never learned it in, a, in a, a book or attending a seminar. I just could see it. And um, yeah, and so I kind of ended up focusing on it by default. I didn't, the, the, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, would I be starting some online niching program or specializing in niching? I wouldn't have said yes. I thought, well, well, that's for somebody else. But it just it became essential to help my clients. I couldn't help them until, until we got to this. Um, but, yeah, what is it? <coughs> um, more specifically, well, so the word um, uh, Canadians say it niche, Americans say it niche, comes from the French verb niche, uh, which means to make a nest. So that's the etymological roots of it. So it's, it's making this little home, this little place that we belong and to say it another way, I think our niche is the role that we want to be known for in the marketplace. And uh, I use that, that wording, the, the role, because it, it, there's a function, there's something we're doing, and it's sometimes it leans really heavily on who we serve, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it learns hev more heavily on what we do and how we do it. So it's, it's this role, the thing we want to be known for. You know, I often say, like, imagine this, you're at a party, and you overhear some people talking about you behind your back. They don't know that you're there. And then they say something about your business. What would you want them to say? Because there are certain things they'd say, oh, no, that's not what I, you know. And there's certain things they could say, and you say, oh, my God, yeah, that's it. That's the thing I want to be known for. That's the buzz I'd like to be spreading, you know, about my business. So that's, that's my sort of sense of niche is, is uh, yeah, what do you want to be known for? What's this role? Yeah. That's really great. And I like that, um, you know, you said once the, the, the niche niche is clear, then it's much easier to help that person with their business. I mean, from a business coach's point of view um, yeah. and from a marketing point of view, because now it's okay. Now we know what we're doing and how we're reaching people, et cetera. So um, is there anything else you want to say about niche before we start going through some of the examples here? No, I don't think so. Okay. So I think the examples are going to really uh, be eye-opening for everyone watching this. And 
everyone, please feel free to comment below if you have any questions about niche. Um, and if you want to share your example, uh, Tad can't necessarily coach everybody who comments with, with, with their example, but I'll certainly you know, pass along the comments to Tad. And uh, so let's get started. We have um, some brave uh, souls here who are willing to kind of share their examples and then we'll, 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 we'll walk through them. Um, so the first one, and what I'm going to do, um, Tad, is I'm going to um, actually put it on screen so that people can read it and we can kind of, you know, kind of work through it, analyze it together. How, how, how does that sound? That sounds great. Okay. So uh, the first one um, is from Marina Francis. And uh, thanks for your patience while I go ahead and pull this up on my screen. And um, Tad, do you want to, well, yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll control the screen and you can tell me to go to the next one or, or whatever. So, so here it is. And um, uh, do, do, you, do you want me to read it? Do you want to go ahead and read it? Yeah, why don't you read it? Okay, I'll read it. And Marina is here on the line with us. So Marina, please feel free to unmute if we want to, you know, might want to have a conversation around this. So, okay, I'll just go ahead and read it. Uh, Marina says, I teach women how to revolutionize their entire relationship with food. And Marina is just kind of chatting this in. So that's why the, um, some of the grammar is not perfect, but thank you for doing this. I teach women how to revolutionize their entire relationship with food. We abandon futile habits of control. Instead, we create lasting practices of, self uh, of relaxed self-trust and enjoyment that embrace and nourish all of who we are, body, mind, and spirit. How we eat becomes a reflection of how we show up for ourselves, for life, and for the world. Okay. So there's a few things with this, Marina. Hello, Marina. Hi, Marina. Nice to have you here. Hey, Ted. <laughs> there you are. Okay. So... Um, so there's a number of things to be mindful of when we talk about niching. One is, uh, well, there's if you imagine a complicated Venn diagram with who, what, where, when, how, why, all, all six of those things, but we could simplify it uh, for the big three, which are the when, or the, the uh, who, the what, and the how. Yeah. Um, you know, this is when we say, what do we want to be known for? It's going to be some combination of those things so um in this i get a real sense of your how but not a sense of what or who mm -hmm. um so when i say how i mean i get a real sense of your point of view of uh, what you think is needed of what your diagnosis is of what some of the core principles of your work are which is very compelling and i'm, I'm really not um discounting this because you know i have a whole book uh, ebook i wrote called point of view marketing so I'm a fan of point of view being shared and it's, I think one of the least talked about things. So the fact that you have a point of view, I'm happy about this. It's good. Um, and by the way, uh, I'm, I'm, I am currently recording the audiobook version of point of view marketing. Okay. So I right, Tad. So, so I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm taking my very slow time with this, but it'll come out eventually, you know, I'm partnering with Tad on this. So it's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so point of view is a big deal. But point of view, there's two ways to look at point of view. If you sell a product, let's say you make boats, well, then your point of view is a point of view about how to make boats. You've got an opinion about the best way to make boats. If your point of view is about a journey, because it's a service which this is, uh, or about solving a particular problem, then it's this point of view about the journey from island A to island B. Yeah, what's the best way um, to write? your opinion on how to best solve, accomplish a goal uh, or solve a problem. It's your opinion about that. So if somebody, let's say, comes to you and says, oh, I have fibromyalgia, and you help them with this, they're going to want to be very curious. Or they're they're going to want to know, well, what's your take on this? How do, how do we address fibromyalgia? You know, what's your opinion on it? Because they're going to be hearing opinions from everybody. And they're going to want an opinion that just makes sense. This is at the end of the day, point of view just has to logically make sense to people because the emotional relevance is handled by the issue. You know, if they're coming to you in pain with something that you don't need to belabor, stick the knife in and twist it around emotionally. It's just there. That's hopefully handled. 
Uh, so point of view does become very important. And I think this is, it's premature here in this type of a statement. So, okay, so I teach women. Okay, so we know it's women, that's good. Uh, so that narrows it down to half the population of the world. <laughs> um, but, um, it, which is something, you know, honestly. Uh, it, and, well, and, and less than that, because it's not girls, you know, we're talking about, mm. uh, you know, women. Right. Um, so that's, that is helpful. It does help people start to picture. But then after that, it doesn't say anything directly about what the problem is they're struggling with or what the result is they're craving. It tells me a lot of what you think they need. So, for example, revolutionize their entire relationship with food. I find myself wondering, are they... Uh, lying, you know, awake at night at 3 a.m. thinking, God, if only I could just revolutionize my relationship with food. Is this the, the language they would use? Probably mm -hmm. not. So to me, this is what you want for them. This is uh, another way of saying it. You know, if island A is the problem, island B is the result they're craving, you could have island C, which is a result that they don't even know is possible. You know, a lot of TED Talks are kind of off the island C. They offer some possibility you haven't even imagined. Permaculture does a lot of island C types. You know, island A, your lawn is terrible and messy. Island B, a beautiful kept lawn. Island C, a food forest. That type of thing. So, um, so when I hear revolutionize the whole relationship with food, that's what I hear is um, a bit of an island C something. It's something that they're... It's probably a desirable thing, but it's something they don't know to crave. And also, it's a bit of your point of view. It's your point of view that that's what should happen, is that they should revolutionize their whole relationship with food. And again, I just don't think that they're, um, they're probably most of them there, unless they are. I mean, this becomes the big question. Yeah, may I, may yeah. I just ask you, um, and yeah. just a little clarifying thing. So... It's great that you are not my niche and you are reading this. I mean, first of all, that's such a valuable thing. Um, so the, the phrase about abandoning the habits of control, that is one of the huge struggles. And so that's there. Um, the, the, Wait, can we pause just a second? Because we're not yeah. quite there yet. I'm going through just sentence yep. by sentence. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, Okay, so we abandon futile habits of control. Um, the, I, I just think there may be a way to say that, that they would say it themselves. As in, I mean, it tells me that they are struggling with control in some way, but how? Like, in what, what, are, what, what are they doing? Part of this is, can you, with your words, paint a picture of the moment that they're in? Um, this is from Jeffrey Van Dyke, a colleague of mine. Such a good question. Is what's the perfect moment for you to show up in their life? There's a moment it's too soon. There's a moment it's too late. So there's so, so where are they in terms of their relationship with this uh, control, the habit of control, and what are they controlling? And can you just say a bit about that? Um, yeah, they are. They're controlling how they're controlling what they eat. Um, they're controlling how much they eat. Mm -hmm. They say a lot of, um, a lot of the words, in fact, that some of the words in the next sentence mm -hmm. are taken directly from intake forms over and over and over again. Um, what else can I say? I'm so tangled up in my own words. I, I, I that's totally clear. Well, I, I should, I should, I should say this to everyone about um, about niching. Uh, you're doomed, and your situation is hopeless. Okay, great. Just, just getting that on the table. Thank you. Good. Okay. okay. If you try to do this on your own, genuinely, it's, I'm, I'm not just niche. I mean, the whole marketing, the whole business thing. You're too close to your own stuff. And me too. I'm too close to my own. Wherever it is, we're stuck. Part of the reason we're stuck is we're, we can't get perspective on it. So whether it's me or somebody else or just friends, it's re, it is really helpful to have other people look at this stuff. Um, so, yeah, you're not alone, of course, of course. And same with your clients with, with their stuff. They're, they're too close. Okay, so um, we abandon futile habits of control. To me, that, that reads this point of view. That reads as you saying what you think needs to happen. And so it lands as a point of view thing versus – you're tired of micromanaging your food choices or you're tired of uh, counting every calorie. You're tired of, uh, you know, uh, 
and you notice I put the word tired. So it's because when everything you described of, well, here's all the things they do to control. I hear it and I think, great, but what's the problem? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. You're, you're describing something accurately, which is good, but I don't hear a problem inside of it. Mm -hmm, yes. Yeah. So what's the problem? What's the problem with them doing those things? What's the problem with them doing those things? Yeah, they're not talking. working. Well, first of all, they're not working. To That's do to what? Um, they're not working to to handle the the probably the biggest three things that my clients are after. Uh -huh. Which are? Which are um, trusting themselves to know what to eat which are relaxing around the beautiful act of eating itself. The, the massive confusion that they are often in. And then once in a while, it's a little bit of weight stuff. I rarely talk about that because it seems to confuse things. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, <clears throat> Right. So it's just interesting. Part of it is the language is, it's, it's almost like it's too tight in a way, or it's too, um, too well polished that it's, it's lost some of the grit for me. The, uh, we create lasting practices. Okay. So first of all, I would cut that in a way, like I don't need to know this. Maybe, maybe it's just, that's point of view. That's what you think they need are lasting practices of some sort. And well, so that's what you tell me. That's actually what they tell me. They tell you what? Um, I, I need something that's going to stick. Okay. See, that language is better. Mm, okay. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you always, you, if you can, use the language they say. Because sometimes, this is a facilitation thing, too. If you've ever been in a group of facilitation something, and the facilitator asks you uh, for ideas, and you say something, but then they write down something else. They write down their interpretation of what you said. So, well, that's not what I said. Right, right. So it's, it's, we really, the, yeah, I need something that's going to stick. So what that has me uh, here is, is um, the past things haven't stuck and that there's probably a certain level of frustration of yes. so many damn things and they haven't stuck and I need something that is sustainable, right. something that I, could, I can actually do over time. And, uh, and then it has me wonder, wait, why did these things not stick? What is it about them that doesn't stick? Um, and, and that question, the answer to that question is the entire body of the work that I do. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, okay. So the lasting practices, I, I hear that there's something there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, you see what I say, like, I need something that's going to stick versus lasting practices is different. Uh, yeah. Relaxed self-trust and enjoyment. Again, that wording is just a little, lands a little jargony for me. Um, mm -hmm relaxed self-trust i just don't know if they would i'm having a hard time saying you know i just need a relaxed self-trust um well what they do is they say i don't trust myself there you go I want to relax around food i just want to relax around food like that's right. what i want amazing this is very good very good you know it's fine. i was talking with a client of mine in uh london england we were sitting in the borough market and he's got a website i think it's painfreemovement.com this took him so long it was like a decade and finally, one of it, he just noticed that his clients kept saying, I just don't want it to hurt when I move. Ah, oh, yeah. He's a physio kind of guy, yeah. So it's like, ah, uh, so he got paid free movement out of that, but that's a great headline. I just don't want it to hurt when I move. It's, yeah. it's often the things that erupt from our clients in these moments of exasperation and frustration. It's, there's your headline. That's the thing right there. Um, you know, I'm sick of this. I'm tired of this. I can't deal with this anymore. It's because it, it has some emotional just it's recognizable. You'd read it and you say, Oh, I've been there. If you have been there, you know, you'd recognize yeah. it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I just don't trust myself. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And the, okay. So the uh, lasting prices, relax, self-trust and enjoyment that embrace and nourish all of who we are. So, okay. Well, let me ask you this question. Let's just say they had these lasting practices that allowed them to of just self-trust and, and, and they could really enjoy food. They could trust themselves, feel more relaxed around food. 
Mm -hmm. um, let's just say they had that. So what? I mean, is that the is that the goal? Is that what they want? Is that is there something that that would give them? Is it that they spent their life being so uptight about food and? Yeah, and and I can. It's a little different for each person. Like you know, an older woman maybe wants to get down on the ground with her grandkids and play. A thirty-five-year-old woman wants to show up more powerfully in her work. And so that last sentence, which I no longer like, that's yeah. what that was about. Because it's it's always different words, Ted. But they'll say like, I want to like I. There's more in me, and I'm so distracted by this damn thing um, that that. You know, it's taking all my energy. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it sounds more like uh, obsessed than distracted, in a way. Um, I think, or, or is, I'm just wondering, because this is part of the thing with niching, is getting the exact right word yeah. really pays off. And so I wonder, I, I hear it, it's taking energy. It's taking some a, a, a consistent focus from them every day. They're, so I'm just wondering. The word that they use, yeah, I hear you about that. It could be an edgy word. Um, because sometimes food can be an addictive thing. They often say like, they, they use the word distraction a lot. Sure. It's like okay. constant distraction. Okay, so that may be the, okay. Um, and again, it's, it can be helpful to, 280 characters, what the hell can you do? But to tell a little bit of the story about this distraction, where it's just, you know, like the every day, it's just some portion of your, every meal time is a drama. Every meal time is stressful. Every time you, there's food, it's like, uh, this, it's, a, it's a epic Greek myth that's, you know, telling it. And you're just like, can I just fucking relax and eat some food? Um, <laughs> I'm half Greek, by the way. That's perfect. Thank you. Sure. And it's like consuming my life, you know, it's, it's, um, so the, to keep working on that wording, because you want it to be the kind of thing that when you they read it, they just like, whoa, yeah, that's terrifying how accurate that was. Um, so the word you, you you know what that means to me? That's visceral. Like yes, like, exactly. It's not pain point, but it's very visceral. Yeah, it's and this is the thing. A pain point isn't something we're trying to. I mean, I don't use that language myself really. I, I understand, but I, I understand. it's. We're not trying to manufacture anything here. Right. We're just trying to speak to something that is there. Where, where advertising went so wrong in my mind is they, um, A, they started to manufacture pain points out of nothing. And B, uh, a lot of shame started getting attached and things got pathologized. They shouldn't have been pathologized. It's just a normal human experience. And, but so acknowledging that somebody's hurt is a very human thing to do. This is a very... Um, because if they don't have the pain, there's no fit. We're not, we don't have anything to offer them. So, yeah. Um, and then, okay, so embrace and nourish all of who we are. To the All of who we are, to me, that's point of view. Um, unless they're saying, I just feel like this nourishes part of me, but this part of me over here isn't, and then that part isn't, but this part a little bit. You know, unless they're talking about part of them feeling malnourished. I don't know, so maybe. Uh, body, mind, spirit. How we... I hear you. Uh, and I think, you know where, let me just put this tiny thing in there. You're right. There's, there's too much confusion and extraneous stuff in there. What they are, most of them, I mean, so many of them are crystal clear mm. that this has to do with their emotional state. Like the overeating oh. has to okay. do with emotions. These are locked together. So I need to find well, a way to talk about that. So you lead with that. Mm -hmm. Like, are you... I mean, this is a crappy wording of it, but uh, are you aware that you overeat for emotional reasons? Mm -hmm. Are you stress eating a lot? Are you, you know, uh, are you feeling just constantly uptight about food or, you know, just there it is. I mean, it could just be that. Um, that this is a really important question, actually, Nisha. I'm glad you said this. A big question around the niche, the statement is, Kind of where are they at in terms of their level of awareness about the problem? So I'll give an example from somebody who's in my mentorship program uh, or used to be. So she does uh, various holistic healing things. And we were chatting and she said, it became very clear that her thing was she liked helping people figure out the emotional roots of like what the hell was behind the physical symptoms. And so on one level, that's a point of view thing. The point of view is that there are emotional roots to physical symptoms. 
But then she realized that's why people were coming to her. And that's actually the work she enjoyed doing. Most of her headline became, do you have some, you know, mysterious physical symptom? And the doctor can't even tell you what it's about, but you you suspect that it has some emotional roots and you don't even know where to start looking for it. I can help. Mm. See what I'm saying? So there's this question of where, where are your people in their awareness of it? Because if you have an ideal client and the, the bullseye for your ideal client is they're really aware of a certain dynamic, they're really aware that oh, this is an emotional thing, but I don't know what it is. Well, then that's their issue. Yes, got it, got it. For so somebody at an earlier it's, stage, it's right. different. It, I think of it as like a bridge. Where are they on the bridge? Yeah. You know, like Jeffrey says. And so my people are, most of them, they're in the middle. They're not way at the beginning and saying like, just give me how many calories do I need about this and that, yeah. but they're not completely enlightened either. They're in the middle. Yeah. So that's, this is always the question. What's the perfect moment to show up and where, what's their awareness level uh, of the issue? Cause then if you speak to them in the moment where they actually are, they feel just so seen. That's, oh yeah, that's me. It's so, and it, it eliminates the muscle and the fuss. And then you have this for ourselves, for life and for the world, I'd probably just cut. I think that goes, when you said extraneous, by the way, I don't think that's totally accurate. The, it's extraneous to this statement, but most of what you've written has immense utility in the point of view or in talking about your bigger why. It's not that it's not useful. It's just the, the right placement. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. This You're is welcome. awesome. And, um, yeah, this is really awesome. Thank yeah. you so much. Awesome. Great. I'm glad. Is this helpful, Marina? Oh, over the top helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. Yes, Wonderful. thank you. And I'll be sure to share the notes of the you know, the notes here uh, in the notes. Yeah, great. Of the video. Notes, George, my God. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so since we have like uh, four or five more uh, examples, and I think we're going to move more quickly, uh, yeah. but I, I feel like it was good to kind of talk this through in more detail because this allowed us to kind of get to the big picture of what we're doing here. So thank yeah. you. The first All one right. really takes a little longer because we're laying some of the foundational ideas. Yes, yes exactly. So let's move on to, uh, to, to Kim's uh, example here. And I'm going to go ahead and paste it in, uh, Wonderful. in here. Okay. So Kim Marie. Okay. Hi, Kim. Hi, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, I'll read this. One. Okay, so I teach women who are tired of the status quo to awaken their inner wisdom so they can confidently speak up for themselves, make wise decisions, face challenges with ease and grace, tap into a sense of self worth and sovereignty of their soul's longings. Okay, first of all, I mean, with this one and the last one, just thank you for doing this work because I know a lot of women who, you know, would be uh, very blessed by this, this kind of work who struggle with each one of these things. Okay, so again, we know that it's women helpful. Uh, that is good to know. Um, tired of the status quo. I don't understand what's meant by status quo here. So that's the first thing to flag is it's a fairly broad, I mean, because if I were to, if we were to even just on this call, we won't, but if I were to ask everyone to just take 30 seconds or write down what, what, what's your understanding of what is the status quo, we'd have all these different answers. Um, so I'm not clear about that uh, and i don't know the context because we could be talking relationship status quo we could be talking uh sexual status quo uh, business uh, economic uh, global economic status quo uh, political you know da, da, da. so there's so many domains this could happen in so it's a little bit broad for me that one um then okay so to do you want to just maybe speak about what is the status quo here for you yeah, so I, I would love help on, that's the word I get stuck with the most because what it feels like the folks that come to me for are, are talking about is like, is this all there is? You know, is this really the way life is supposed to be? I just keep feeling like there's something else for me. There's something else I should be doing. There's a different way I could be doing it. There's a different way. And it tends to apply to life in a broad way. So like, I'm sick of the politics. I'm sick of the economic status. I'm sick of not, you know, having certain um, abilities to do the things I really want to do, have the voice I want to have. I'm just tired of things the way they are. So that's what I mean by status quo. Yeah. Okay. So that's still broad. So yeah. this is, um, so I would just encourage you to really sit with, okay. Cause I mean, I'm with you on all these things that are frustrating and, 
what's the part of the status quo that's most frustrating for you and your people? Like, what's the one that makes them, you know, really want to holler? What's the one that keeps them uh, awake at night? Um, you know, it's to really, to really zone in on this. As yeah, or, or, or if I can jump in, like, what's one that you have heard your clients, uh, since you have had paying clients, obviously, which one would you say they come to you for? Or they, yeah. yeah. And that is the challenge because I've had so many, I've had literally people coming for all the different reasons and it always stems back. That's the common thread. They're tired of things as they've been and they want something different. They're looking to break old patterns. They're looking to have a, you know, a different way of relating. They're looking to stand up for themselves, but it's, I get clients in all of that. And so that's the challenge I keep having with this. Yeah. So here's the, um, because the way you articulated it turned it into every human that's ever lived. And, you know, I'm tired of the way it is and I want it to be different. We literally can't get broader than that. I know. So, um, <laughs> so part of it is there may be some decisions to make about the, who you want to work with, uh, what types of issues you most want to focus on. Because uh, at this point, it's extremely broad women's empowerment. Um, so, okay, so there, there's, there's a few things here. Again, there's the who, the what, the how as, as um, things to focus on. Also, there could be the where. I mean, if you decide to focus very locally, the, this really does help refine it. But uh, let's say the who, the what, and the how. So right now, the who is every woman, almost every woman that's ever lived. So that's real broad. So, th so there just could be decisions made to, to refine this, to decide, you know what? Okay, there are a lot of things in the status quo, um, but I'm gonna focus on these ones. Okay. So the thing that's come up for me the most along that is speaking up for themselves. Yeah, I was good. That was my next question uh, was gonna be that. And it's interesting because you say, okay, so to awaken their inner wisdom so that they can speak up for themselves. So I could just see this, you could, one could reword this and shorten this just that um, I teach women to speak up for themselves. You know, that could be the, that could be the thing. And then the rest of it could be, um, let's see, I teach women to speak up for themselves. Um, Make wise decisions, face challenges with recently. Well, okay, well, here's a question. Uh, why do you think they don't make wise decisions? What's going on there? I, I do think that the idea of speaking up for themselves is what things tend to stem back to. So in other words, they don't feel confident in the voice that they have to make the right choice. Okay, right. Facing challenges with ease and grace <laughs> seems like they're something. like I don't know what to do. I'm not sure how to handle this. I it, it's a confidence piece too. So that's in addition to speaking up, it it has a lot to do with confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. So if it's easy and grace to happen to a sense of self worth, of course, if you had self worth and sovereignty, you could speak up for yourself. Um, okay, so let's just okay. So now, um, so let's say I teach women to uh, uh, speak up for themselves as a kind of core kernel of this. Where are they at in their awareness of why they don't speak up for themselves or what that's about? Like, are, are they even aware that they don't speak up for themselves? That's a great question. Um, I don't know, you're right. I think I'm not sure that they would actually say that's the problem that they have. No. It's more, it's probably more I don't feel confident. I don't feel like I'm, I'm strong enough within myself. I don't feel like I know what to do or how to make a decision. I think that's probably more of what they would say. Yeah. Do they feel like they get bullied a lot or they go with the group? or? No, they, not so much that. It's more right. just feeling like they're kind of floundering. Like they just don't right. feel right in where they are or how to be themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, and this is always, there's no right answer on this one, but one way you could look at the niche is you could say, you know what? No, I want to work with women who already know that their issues, they don't speak up for themselves mm -hmm. and they're catching themselves and they're saying, ah, damn it. There I went again, stayed silent, didn't say anything, said yes, just to people, please, you know, 
you that could you could decide that's I want to focus on women who are already at that level of awareness. But so that, let's that could be the bullseye, and it could be that one ring out is and this these are different offers for different levels too. You know, um, do you feel like you're you're floundering? Might reach a broader, slightly broader uh, group. But then you know, I could see a really useful um, like a free offer kind of PDF pink spoon of just three reasons why you don't speak up for yourself. Mm. You know, when it matters, when it counts. Something like that could be become a really interesting uh, free offer. But yeah, always figuring out what is this simple. I mean, I love how clear you were. So it's, no, it's the speaking up for yourself, the confidence piece. Um, and then what are the situations where they tend not to speak up for themselves most? Um, in the face of authority, like whoever they perceive as authority, like, uh, you know, that's, that's been my journey too. So that's, of course, where yeah. I'm coming from. And, and um, that's, I, I'd say that's the biggest. And also relationships, you know, being able to really – uh, verbalize their needs to their partner, their family, their, even their kids, you know, being able to get kids to do what they are supposed to do, so to speak. They struggle in that way. Like, I'm, I'm afraid to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. So there's, yeah, it, it spills over into relationships. Sure. It's interesting. I mean, the, the speaking truth to power is a sort of, uh, yeah. Okay. Something that you said from Marina that, that resonated a lot for me was the idea of also the, the point of view. And for me, my programs are based on sustainability. So like when you say maybe they're aware that mm. they, don't, they don't speak up, but they're looking for how can I do this regularly? How can I have a way to keep this going in my life? Like I see myself, but I don't know how to get it in me so that it's it's in me to to take action with when i need it so a lot of my work is very much about i don't teach people to speak up in one session i i have a 12-month program i have you know longer term practices and things like that because i believe it's about embodying something different mm -hmm. yeah and so <clears throat> i mean that can be part of the niche because you know i was saying in the beginning well the who's pretty broad now as soon as we narrow it to women who are struggling to speak up that's that's much clearer, mm -hmm. and then the how can also be part of the um, uh, the niche of what you're known for, you know. And here's how I do it: I do it through a year long program, or I do it, and I do it based on this philosophy, this particular point of view. This is I've a kind of take on it uh, of why we don't speak up and what the best way is to address it. Because you could imagine a woman, oh, I really struggle to speak up, and and uh, so they go online and struggling to speak. Why do I struggle to speak up? And there's just so many people, you know, be like, you go down to the Harbor on Island A. So you want to get off Island A, go to Island B. Yeah. And then you, there's thousands of boats and they're all going to Island B. And maybe they, and, and the prices are all over the place. And you, how do you choose? And even the, the cheapest ones, there's a lot of them. And so point of view, this, well, what's the route they take? And who's the captain? There's a kind of credibility that needs to be there. And so the, the just it's good to know that the how can be, you know, I, we help people uh, cure uh, fibromyalgia through a vegan diet, through a, a paleo diet, through a macrobiotic diet, through an Ayurvedic approach, through an emotional approach. You know, there's so many different ways you could come at the issue. And that can go in the, the niche statement, you know, if you can fit it in. But, um, you know, the, the, a, a typical way to say this uh, I think I got originally from Robert Middleton and, and uh, it's used pretty commonly in this scene is the, you know how blank kind of people struggle with blank kinds of problem. Well, I help them get blank kind of result as a you fill in the blanks. So, but you know, there are a lot of women who just struggle to speak up in certain moments, you know, particularly around authority or maybe in relationships. Um, yeah, I help them. And then it, it maybe it's, it's interesting. The result are you know, I help them speak up consistently, right? Help them figure out why, they don't speak up or I help them, you know, what's the result that they're craving that they're coming with. And, you know, and then it can be um, looking over the other results here. I help them. Yeah. You know, it's, I help them tap into such a strong sense of self worth and self sovereignty that speaking up becomes much easier. Mm. You know, even, even in situations that might've scared them. Sometimes these tags are nice in a niche statement. Like even if, even uh, yeah, in a situation that would have terrified them, even if it seems impossible now, even if uh, they can't imagine how those types of things can, just because it, it um, 
it's very affirming of the present moment from them. Like, you're right. I don't think this is possible. Yeah. And I love, I, I've been working with your niching nest book. Oh, and, um, and the, I, I haven't gotten through all of it, but one of the things that really stood out for me that I've been trying to play with a little is the, that you said a niche can be a question and you just said it now with my, my thing, oh. that, like the, the, why do I think people have a hard time speaking up or not being self-sovereign? And, um, and yeah. so that resonates for me a lot that, that I think the women that I work with tend to feel like, why can't I do this consistently? Like I know what I need to do, but I don't know how to stay in it. I don't know how to keep, keep myself moving forward and really break free of what I've been used to for so long. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that type of thing of like, why can't I speak up for myself? What the hell? It happened again. Yeah, yeah. So, and th this could be, th that that's a headline right there. Mm -hmm. You know, and they read it and say, oh, man, that's, you know, attention women, in quotes, that question. And and it's like, hey, the, then the body of it is just, look, hey, I get it. It's It's, you got the best intentions and then you collapse. And, you know, every once in a while, you're able to stand up for yourself, but you can't seem to, it's not a consistent thing for you. And it's real frustrating. And why? You know, well, here's my thoughts. And then the sales letter becomes not a, here's why to hire me. But the sales letter becomes you making your case for your point of view and perspective. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Wow. That's some beautiful work. Thank you for doing it. Thanks, Kim. Is that helpful? Yes, super helpful. Thank you so much. Awesome. I really appreciate it. Great, great. Okay, so next up, uh, we're going to go to Chris and then Eddie. Okay. Um, so, Chris, I'm going to go ahead and put yours up here. Uh, and, of course, feel free to uh, unmute. And hi there. Hey. hey, Chris. Great. Okay, so... Chris, uh, here's, your, here's the statement, and Tad, I'll just let you read it. Okay. Okay, I work with folks who feel lost under the conflicting messages about how they should live and the weight of their own fears, judgments, and self-mistrust. Uh, we dig below the noise to find their still point, their center and base camp for an intentional, easeful, exuberant life. Okay. Um, This feels like it could be every human. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of these times, these niche statements, it's so close to being really specific, but it's just, it misses a few things. And so suddenly it goes all, because I think all, it'd be hard to find a human in the world that doesn't live under conflicting messages about how they should live, you know, or who doesn't have fears or judgments or, or self mistrust at some level. Uh, I think every human could identify with that. And so then that's a problem because then it's, you know, that's, that's all, all the people. Um, so what are the particular conflicting messages that you want to help people with? Um, well, a lot of times it's, um, I guess it's like what, what a good and successful and meaningful life is. And that's something that they have a lot more um, ability to craft. But most of them have been, they've been bombarded with messages about what that's supposed to look like, that they've lost touch with their own wanting. They're even afraid. They'll say things like, I'm not even sure what I want because, and they're afraid to look at it because it might be wrong. So a lot of times they're coming from like strong authoritative traditions and um, they just feel like there's the plot of their life got lost under all the different narratives that have been thrown on them. Um, and so they don't have, they don't have by whom? Um, by um, parents, teachers, um, uh, messages that they have um, imbibed from the the culture at large their peers um now, of those which ones which of those do you think are the strongest influences probably um uh family and religion yeah okay 
And so let, let me just float this to you. What if, okay, imagine this, you're at a party and you hear mm. people talking about you behind your back. And I said, yeah, the guy, Chris, what does he do? He seems like an interesting guy. Oh, you know, his thing is he, um, you know how like a lot of people grew up in these extremely authoritarian religious families and uh, it just fucks them up for the rest of their life because they have this kind of script of how they're supposed to be, but now they're kind of waking up and, and they're, they're clear they want out of that, but they don't know what the next thing is. He helps them kind of de-indoctrinate themselves, you know, from that and actually find the life that they, they should live. How would that feel for you? That feels good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, I mean, to, I'm just, <clears throat> of course there, there's more possibilities here, but um, that suddenly sounds very clear. And it's, it's, um, I mean, I'm just riffing on this. I'm not saying that should yeah. be the thing, but that's the type of thing that if I heard it, I'd say, damn, that's really clear. And it'd be one of those things I'd have in the back of my mind. And then I'd be at a party talking with somebody. It's like, yeah, you know, I just grew up in this religious family and I'm just so, uh, oh man, I, I know a guy. And then if the website is easy to find along that name, I don't know what, what the hell the URL would be. Um, rec you know, recovering from overly authoritarian, strict religious families dot com. <laughs> right. But I don't know. Maybe there's, there's some URL that you could have that would capture this. Right. If it's easy to find later on, and you write about this, this kind of recovering from, you know, because what's interesting is, let's say that's the bullseye. The bullseye is they grew up in an overly strict authoritarian religious family, and now they're finding themselves. Well, there's a, the, the next ring out might be teachers, because maybe it was, a, it was a boarding school, and, and there was that, and that played into it, but probably because their parents sent them there. But then there's the culture at large, and so it's, you can still have those things there. You know, you can be explicit without being exclusive in your niching. You could explicitly, everything you say from now on could be, I work with people who grew up in these kinds of families, helping them recover from that. Uh, you could get that tattooed on you. You could just have right, yeah. business cards. And yet people would still come to you saying, you know, I, I didn't grow up in that kind of family, but I just kind of picked it up in the culture. And I feel like, you know, I, I grew up in a real materialist something and it wasn't overly religious, but I still feel messed up in this way that I don't know what I want. And you, you helped my friend, uh, John, and could you help me? So you, you can be explicit without being exclusive. You'll still, this is just for everyone to know. Um, you, you could really be so explicit and pick this one thing and that's all you talk about. And yet a third or half of your clients will be other than that. And how is that possible? Just because you're, you're helpful to people and they tell their friends and their friends aren't always going to be a bullseye. And then you choose if you want to work with them or not. It's up to you. So you just don't need to be worried about losing the other things because you focus on the one thing. Um, but so, okay. So let's just say we rolled with that as a potential and then, yeah, because then all the, oh, George, scroll back up. I can't see. <laughs> uh, okay, so where it says um, conflict, right? So conflicting. Um, oh, here's a question. This is one of my favorite niching questions. I'm glad this comes up. Secretly, the people you work with, who do they envy or what kinds of people do they envy? Uh, um, people who people who know seem to know what they want and go for it yeah such as like such what would be popular culture kind of examples of the types of people like i think of people who go to burning man bohemian mm -hmm. types or i, I think go to burning man <laughs> um did you grow up in an overly strict religious family oh for sure yeah okay so but yeah so it's these types of specifics you know can really help uh, when you're articulating, it's like, you know, in a sales letter, even in a niching statement, you know, you grew up on one side, you grew up in this family that was so controlling and here's how you're supposed to be. And this is what it means to lead a good life. But now you're like, Burning Man looks pretty hot. Yeah. That looks amazing, actually. But no, sin. Oh, my God, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. I can't want it, but I do. And no. But it's not that bad. They actually seem like good people. That's what the devil would want me to think, you know. Right. You know, so part of this is one of the one of the best ways to articulate a niche sometimes is there's a tension between two things. Mm -hmm. And if you can help articulate what that tension is, um, people are just like, oh, my God, I'm so in that place of trying to 
I'm torn. You know, this feeling of, uh, yeah, being torn between these things. But that question of who do they envy, it's a good one for everyone to think about because this, it's one of the best questions I know to really nail what Island B is. Hmm. You know, because there's so much in that. They envy these kinds of people, but why? What do those people have that they want? This, uh uh-huh. Okay, well, there's your Island B. They're free. They do what they want. Um, But, oh, man, I tell you what, if you really focus on that, and you you start writing articles about that, doing videos about that, the hubs for that start to become, I, I get, there's so many networks. There must be meetup groups galore for this that you could go and speak at. There must be tons of podcasts about this, mm. you know, and mercy, you could, I think you could do very well in this. And it's a clear enough thing. I hope everyone hears this. It's so clear that it's real easy to remember. And the, the most, okay, so there's three things, three um qualities of a target market in my mind a good one one is this and by clear i mean i know if i'm in that group or not immediately there's no fuzziness for me when you say it i'm not well am i do i feel lost under conflicting messages how i should well i mean sort of but you know depends on the day on tuesdays i usually feel pretty clear it's a good day for me. like you don't want that no fuzziness so it's number one is clear i know if i'm in the group or not number two are there enough of them who can afford to pay you the full price helpful to helpful to be aware of this because if there's not you have a non-profit on your hands which god bless it but right. structure it as that third can you find them are there hubs in other words um and um of those three so when i think of this one we were riffing with very clear i know immediately if i'm in that or not second are there enough yeah i would say so especially yeah god of course and then can you find them I would think so. I mean, I'm kind of, as I'm talking, you know, maybe ideas come, but then this becomes a next step that you could just go on Facebook and say, look, I'm experimenting with this as a niche. And I would encourage it as an experiment, you know, date your niche before you marry your niche. But you can say, I'm just, I'm thinking of doing this. And so you could say, I'm just going to do a day long workshop on this, or I'm going to offer teaching spots just focused on this thing in particular or whatever it is. But I'm wondering, where would I find people who grew up like this? Like, where are these people? And you can just start to ask people on Facebook, uh, send emails, text people, personal conversations. But for the next while, I would just be asking around. Because you Mm -hmm. may find there are huge networks of this, conferences that go on. Um, You know, the whole atheist movement, my God, there you go. There's hubs galore on this. Um, and it's another question to ask that can help refine um, the type, and th- this could work for everyone, but is what are the books or authors that they're drawn to, you know, mm-hmm. or documentaries that they've watched that they that your people would really resonate with? So, because that, that helps refine, like, are they the kind of people who got in a really, actually like Richard Dawkins? Or are they saying, no, I'm still like the religion thing, but I just, I'm not atheist, but, you know, what TED Talks, what, um, yeah. Because you can put that on your on your website. If you go to a, one of my clients, showgirlawakening.com, she's actually in San Francisco, uh, Kalita. She does burlesque as women's empowerment. But she's got this section of we might be a perfect fit if you're into the following things. And you read it. And just vibe-wise, it's like you would immediately know if you were her people or not. Uh, so you can come up with your own version of that. And it can be very helpful. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, beautiful. Well, I mean, if, if uh, bless you for doing this just in general and, and that particular, man, I've just known a lot of people over the years who would, who would have been so incredibly blessed to have found somebody who, like yourself, has gone through that journey. Be huge for them. One category of this that I was um, explored at one point, but I didn't get any traction on, surprisingly, was um, I'm, I'm an out gay man. Um, who grew up in a strong Catholic tradition, and oh. and there are a lot. It, it, fortunately, there isn't as much shame in, in the closet as there used to be, but there is still a lot of like residual conditioning that attaches to people. But mm. I, I was never able to get much traction with that. I actually had a whole website devoted to that. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. There's some things you think this would be such a great niche. It, it, it makes sense. It seems like it would be, and then it's just for whatever reason they offer the niche thing, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't land. Um, of course it could have been my, the way I put it out there too. It's, it's that, was, that was pre-George. 
Well, well thank you so much and, and uh, really good wishes on this uh, moving forward. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks, Chris. Awesome. Um, just a time check. Uh, Tad, do you need to get going at the top of the hour? I don't, I don't okay. know. I, I'm, I'm okay too, so we can kind of keep going until um, – until we finish or, you know, until there's, there's feeling like we need to close off. But we've got Eddie's example, and then we've got Katie as well, and Anne. So uh, we'll, we'll try to, you know, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Uh, so let's go to Eddie. And, um, oh, if, um, if, yeah, if Katie or Anne needs to go first, just time-wise, let me know. But I'll just put Eddie's here for now. I want to make sure I spell your last name right. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, I work with overachievers who are starting to question why they work so, why they work so hard but don't know how to stop. I help them figure out who they are and what they really want to do with their lives. Okay. So, what I like about this one is it it speaks to the moment they're in. It's not just that they're an overachiever because this could read I work with overachievers and help them figure out who they are, what they really want to do with their lives. And you hear how much fuzzier that is than what he's done is he's actually named the moment they're in. They're an overachiever, and now they're starting to question this. I think this could do with a bit more of the uh, symptoms in terms of, I mean, like, they're an overachiever. Well, so what? I mean, that sounds great. They achieve a lot. They, they achieve over what everyone else does. So why is that a problem? My guess is it's having some consequences on their life, um, such as burning out, panic attacks, um, resenting people a lot, um, doing things that they don't want to do, uh, this, this type of consequence. And is Eddie on the phone or did, he's not here? I'm here. Oh, you're here. Great. Okay. So yeah, what's the problem with overachieving? Well, it, like in, in practical terms, you know, so what? Yeah. You really named a lot of the burnout. Um, the sense oh, of uh, hey, Eddie, um, the volume is kind of low on your side. I don't know if there's anything you can do to turn it up. Let me see. How's that? Is that better? Yes, it is. Great. Thanks. Okay, Go ahead. Good. Um, so a lot of what I hear is, you know, I'm really good at working hard and being successful, but I have no idea what I really want. It, it's not what I want. Um, it's all pretty meaningless and empty feeling to me. So they, they have this sense that like, they have this great engine that, you know, if they just set it in the right direction, they'd be happy. Um, also overachievers, I meet tend to struggle with this. It's like comes from a place of fear. They're working so hard that perfectionism comes from a place of low self worth, and their achievements are almost like this compulsion. Like they do it because otherwise their life would feel meaningless, you know, or, or like, um, yeah, it, it's kind of, they don't really enjoy it. Like on the outside, they look the same as a high performer, but except they don't actually enjoy what they're doing and they don't. Um, okay. I, I, just, I love that distinction, high performer versus overachiever. Mm -hmm. That's a really great, I mean, that's a point of view piece. Um, but that's, that'd be a killer thing to write about or having a talk. Like I want to make a distinction between high performer and overachiever. You know, and the difference is the overachiever burns out, doesn't enjoy it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so out of these symptoms, uh, so burnout, resentment, addictions, uh, feeling meaningless, empty, um, which, which of those are um, the biggest ones? I would say perfectionism. Um, but what's the problem with perfectionism? Isn't it good that things get yeah. perfect? It's, it's um, the problem with perfectionism is procrastination and not being, you're, you're sort of not a good 
coworker when you're a perfectionist. So um, some of some of the overachievers that I meet who are perfectionists, they struggle with becoming leaders or managers in their field. They struggle to climb the ladder, and that that you know really frustrates them because they want to achieve, but they can't because they're um, they're not able to work with others basically. So mm -hmm. they're not able to take any kind of feedback. They take criticism very personally, very um, strongly. Mm. So that's like one. And then the feeling of meaninglessness is also a big one. That like, what's all this for? Why am I working so hard? Do yeah. I even do this anymore kind of feeling? Mm -hmm. Right, okay, so I'm hearing, it. <laughs> George, thanks for the bullet points here. So I'm seeing, yeah, one, so it's interesting, I mean, perfectionism is, this is, this is a really important thing in terms of, of niching is, is it a symptom or is it a diagnosis? And it really depends of, on how aware they are of it. If they're aware of it, if they would say, yeah, I'm a perfectionist here, then it's a symptom. If they're not aware of it, if they're just aware that, yeah, God, I put off work all the time and keep trying to climb the ladder and it, it's not working and uh, even though I'm really good at what I do, I just don't seem to get along with people and, and uh, yeah, criticism is real hard to take. But they haven't uh, you know, made the connections that, oh, this is because I'm, an, uh, I'm a perfectionist. Then it's not a symptom. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. So part of this, again, is where are they at in their awareness of this? So what I'm seeing from what you wrote before was, so they're overachieving and they're just wondering, wait a minute, why am I working so hard? Um, okay, so again, the um, do you think perfectionism, they're aware of it? Like, oh, this is, I'm a perfectionist and this is costing me in the same way that they're aware, aware of I'm, an over, I'm overachieving? I would, I would say they, they would identify with being a perfectionist, but I'm not sure that they would say that it's a problem. Got it. Okay, so I wouldn't say that that's a symptom then. Yeah. Okay, but they would identify with being an overachiever? Yeah. Okay, great. So good to make these distinctions. Okay, so then, again, what's the biggest problem here? Is it the burnout? Would you, okay, so look, these three, burnout, resentment, addictions. What's the biggest of those three for them? And actually, I'm not sure that that was what... Um... Eddie would say are the are the symptoms, right? You like meaninglessness? Is that the biggest yeah, one? Right. Yeah, I think meaninglessness that they're just living in constant fear of failure, of criticism, of um, mm. you know their own of uh, imposter syndrome is a big thing that overachievers struggle with. Um, yeah, yeah. Just this feeling that I, I can't keep going like this you know I'm, I'm losing friends I you know this is not sustainable um, they kind of don't see how this could how uh, they don't see a way forward like, why are like, they losing friends um, usually because of their lack of work-life balance mm. they're just always working or they're always thinking about work maybe complaining about work um, sort of like fixated on what they're lacking yeah okay so i mean this is the type of thing in a niche statement that you could in, in a conversational way at a party so said, what do you do you say well you know you know there are a lot of people and they're just overachievers and they're always working but never you know and it's it's um they lose friends because of it is there a um eddie workaholism of course is a is a real word i don't know is that something they use as a word that they re resonate with to me, that word is kind of dated for some reason. Like, oh, okay. Okay. Um, what what people might say now is, "I I just don't have work life balance." Yeah. Or, okay. Um, Got it. All right. He's calling you old, George. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm definitely dated in uh, in some of these things. The corp corporate life, I'm I way way dated. That's like what they might call their their dad or something you know like oh yeah my dad was a workaholic but i'm i just lack work-life balance you know kind of thing. <laughs> uh, 
Well, let me give you a great example from the Dick Van Dyke show. The, uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, that was me dating myself. Um, yeah, nobody? Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a good one. I've, I've, I've heard of it somewhere on Wikipedia or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, but, so, uh, but you, you see what I'm saying? It can be a very colloquial, yeah, I work with these people who are overachievers, and you can just rattle off some of the consequences. You know, and it costs them in these ways. And they're just starting to wonder, wait a minute. You know, why the hell am I working so hard? You know, I, and, and, and the imposter thing. And they feel a bit like an imposter. They feel like at any second people are going to see through, you know, the facade or something. And, and it's, yeah. So I, that's just, I think that's the piece I was missing in this. Is I get that they're an overachiever, but so what? Like, what's the issue? What's the, to, to bring it into the, the grit of the real world, you know? Um, is, it, is, it, is there a relationship, is there intimate relationship in, in danger because of this? Like their spouse is complaining? And... Yeah, definitely. I think that's yeah. definitely um, a consequence. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Yeah, so this, and this, this is something to be starting, I would just really be paying attention to this with your clients. Uh, but also notice uh, there may be certain symptoms you're more drawn to, which may shape it, but just what, are, what have been the costs to them, real world, tangible costs of this uh, overachieving, you know, of that pattern in their life? What is, what's happening as a result? Because the more in, the, in a little niche statement or in a headline or in a, you know, we can tell the story a bit where they hear it and they say, oh man, that's me. Because to just say, I work with over overachievers, you know, so it's that first thing in the niche. Is it clear? Well, you have people say, well, yeah, I achieve. I mean, I guess I achieve. I mean, I, I maybe you see what I'm saying, but it's fuzzy. But if you start to lay out the, a little bit of a snapshot of their life, they're like, oh my God, you know, where you say, yeah, you know, burning out and it just feels so meaningless and they're losing friends and they, and it's costing their, um, their intimate relationship with their partner who's starting to give them signals, you know, that uh this is not gonna this can't last forever and and then and, and maybe like and even with all that they can't seem to stop mm. you know overachieving mm. and is this specifically in the context of work that they're overachieving i would say that's where it shows up the most but this kind of the over the mechanism that drives the overachieving shows up in socially as well you know um it's like this sense of always needing to be the best in anything it could show up like even with hobbies or with dating or with sex or with um you know being just needing to be the best at whatever it is that they do okay and so this may be part of a this could be one of the things that you want to decide on is which of those domains of overachieving do you most want to focus on because each one of those is a really rich field because one of them moves towards kind of sex addiction or one of them moves towards the kind of work addiction and, and compulsion. One of them is uh, you're just an asshole with your friends. It's like, can't stop competing or you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It, I would so, say work is definitely what I'm most personally familiar with and you know. So. Okay. So then I would, I would hone in on that. Okay. And the other ones, you'll get an aura where you would still attract people who have the other things. Mm -hmm. People still come, and mostly through word of mouth of the people you work with, mm -hmm. where somebody's like, you know, man, I just can't stop trying to be the best at this thing. That's not work. And their friend says, oh, I was working with this guy. You should talk to him. That, that kind of thing will start to happen over time. Um, but so uh, that could be an, a way to hone it. Because then it's like, you say, look, uh, you know, there's a lot of people and they just, they, uh, overachievers at work and you know, they're, they're burning out and what's the point? And they're looking at their boss and it's like, I don't care that much about you. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Why am I, but you see what I'm saying? As soon as you start to contextualize it, I can picture it more. And I know if you're talking about me more. Uh, and then there's also, I mean, there's self-employed people 
And then there's people who are employed in another job and that may or may not make a difference because there's certainly over uh, self-employed people who are overachievers, mm -hmm. you know, and it can cost them in very similar ways. So there may be a distinction to make there, maybe not. And also, uh, Tad, something you said earlier about how, like what kind of people they envy might be an interesting question to hear. That's a really like, good question. What kind of, what kind of person does the overachiever envy? Like, is he or she looking at a relative or a friend going, God, why, why can't it be like that? It's ironic because they want to achieve to be the very best. And that includes, you know, living a life that's meaningful, right? It makes me think of there's a story of the dentist, Patty Lund, who was a very, very successful dentist, was making a ton of money and was driving to work in his fancy clothes and his fancy car and driving past a construction site. A construction worker was just walking to work with his lunch pail and just you know, so happy. And it's something inside Patty Lawn snapped. Because he said, how is it that I make so much more than this man? And he's happy and I'm neurotic and miserable. Yeah. So it's just interesting that sometimes the envy may be like, I just envy people who clock in and clock out. They do the nine to five, they go home and they just watch TV, live a life, enjoy themselves. You know, they don't, so it could be this. Um, but yeah, the envy question could be very useful here. Cause again, it really hones like, what is the, cause okay. Cause what we understand now is Island A, they're overachieving maybe in a context of work. Here's all the symptoms about it. And they're starting to question why they're working so hard, but they don't know what to do about it. That's Island A, they don't know how to stop. Yeah. Oh God, I want to stop, I don't know how. Okay, you help them figure out who they are, what they really want to do with their lives. That's good. It's, I, I, I would give that like a 60% because I feel like there's just probably a punchier way of saying it. Um, but the, here's what I would do. I would just really hone that Island A mm -hmm. and the Island B may kind of suggest itself. And the question of who they envy, very helpful in this. Because um, again, it's, um, if we can say it in a colloquial way, uh, it's just I help them figure out who they are, what it's good. It can work. I just think you may be able to punch it up a bit. Okay. Yeah. But Chris, this is great. Wonderful, Alrighty. wonderful work. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, man. Okay. So, um, should we do one more, Ted? How are you feeling? Yeah, let's do one more. Okay. All right. So, Anne is still here. Thank you so much, Anne, for your patience. And uh, let's go ahead and Let's go ahead and take yours here. Okay. All right. So, Tad, I'll let you take it away here. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, I work with women who are tired of living in the whirlwind of life. I teach them ways to slow down, let go of expectations and judgment, and connect with what matters most to them. Okay. This is generally pretty clear. So, uh, tired of living in the whirlwind of life. Can you, when you say the whirlwind of life, what do you mean by that? Um, what I mean, it's almost like they are so lost in the motions. They're just continually going through the motion. One day goes into another day and, you know, and then it's like, oh my gosh, what is happening with my, my life? It's, it's, it's almost as if they're not being intentional. So they're not, um, they're not caught up in the whirlwind being intentional and they're really present as they go through it. But it's just kind of like, it's just like this swirl around them. Yeah. That, um, they're just really, they're just kind of lost in it that they're not conscious of the days. They're just kind of going through the motions. And um, so what? So they don't really, they just don't want to get to the end of their life. Not that they're really thinking this, I guess, but they don't want to get to the end of their life and think that's it. So I don't know that they have the awareness of that. I think their desire is like something's off, something's missing. And I really don't know what it is, but there has to be more to life than this. Yeah. Okay. So th this is the big question I'd be asking for, for, for yours is, yeah, what's that moment that they're in in their life? Um, that like what's happening that's having them be tired of living in the whirlwind of life because some people live in the whirlwind of their uh, until the end mm -hmm, right you know, 
they're in the whirlwind and then they drop dead of a heart attack and that's it. And they never got anywhere else other than that. So you're, and they never questioned it. And they never questioned it. They never even saw it was a whirlwind. Right. You know? Right. The uh, awareness wasn't there. So it, clearly these women are in some way. And so there's this, so it's like, what's the moment they're in and what's their uh, awareness about even why they're in the whirlwind? Yeah, you know, it just came up for me having you asked me that is um, I think about like the first half of life a lot of times is about accumulating. The second half of life is a lot about what can I let go of? And I think especially for females and especially like females who may or may not have gone through menopause, but they're definitely in those years. It's, it's like they just want to create meaning in their life because so much of it has been doing stuff for everybody else. And so they're just ready to, I, I don't know, that, it's not like they're sitting at their coffee table saying, well, I'm just ready to step into my own life, but they just know there's something, it's almost like they feel like they're being pulled, but they don't know what is outstretched pulling them forward, if that makes sense. Uh-huh, mm -hmm. that's good, that's good. So first thing is, I think this could be honed uh, with probably well, I mean, the demographics are a funny thing to play with, but just to, to fiddle with it. And I say funny thing to play with because sometimes it's always good to ask whenever we have a demographic like in the second half of their life or menopause, why? And it's, you know, uh, that may indicate the real thing that we need. It, the, and the demographic is just where we likely find them. But, okay, but let's just roll with this. Because mm -hmm. you could hone it to say, I work with women who are now in the second half of their life or who are now you know, in that area of menopause or their, um, however you'd like to say it. Yeah, and they, um, so even just that hones it for me a bit. Right. Because when I hear whirlwind of life, that could also mean, I don't know, the 21 year old who just came back from Burning Man. It's like, man, yeah. I'm partying too much, life is crazy. And that may or may not be who your ideal client. Also, Anne, I wonder in terms of, you know, that, that moment in their life, like, like what changed that made them start to become aware of this question? Like, for example, yeah. maybe they were really busy taking care of kids for years and now mm -hmm. the kids are more grown up and right. they're, you know, in school and now they have time to themselves a little bit more <laughs> and maybe like, well, what now? Or I don't know. Or maybe their kids went off to college or is that right. maybe that's part of it? Maybe not. I would say that's definitely part of it, but I don't know that they have to have kids at the same point. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there, there's definitely something I see about um, a contrast of speed and slowness here. There's something about Island A where everything is moving very fast. Mm -hmm. Island B is the kind of, <clears throat> so, but this is an important thing. Are they craving slowing down? Or is that what you want for them? Um. Well, I don't have the client experience to be able to tell you from like an evidence standpoint. Um, so I guess part of that would be what I'm wanting for them based on what I'm witnessing in my own life. And I know there's a couple other master hearts who talk quite a bit about slowing down also. Yeah. I mean, your, your own life is definitely obviously evidence and also looking, looking at your own friends, you know, or people, you know, um, mm -hmm. you know so. And it, the other thing is, what are the expectations or, or judgments that you want to help them let go of? So it would be really expectations that they place on, them, place on themselves. It could be to be anything. I mean, it could be they place those expectations on themselves because they think a parent wants that of them or a spouse or a friend or something like that. Or, and the judgment would be a lot of self-judgment that comes around um, really all those expectations that they feel that they're not meeting, you know, or just the inner critic who's just gone, gone crazy. Yeah. So that's something I would probably work on articulating. And, mm -hmm. you know, if, if this is um something you have had um, a personal experience with, this has been your journey. I would just write down what were the expectations you find yourself letting go of, the judgments you find yourself letting go of. Okay. You know, that, that'll speak to people. Mm -hmm. Sure. We're, we're not that different. Um, okay, so here's the th question. So, okay, let's just say they were to slow down. 
mm-hmm. and really let go of their expectations and judgments and connect with, connect with what matters most to them, what would happen then? What would that give them then? Um, I, I believe that they're really going to be starting to step more fully into their life. They're going to show up as their most authentic self. They're not going to be concerned about what people think of them. They're going to just be themselves. Yeah. So there's, so I hear on Island A, they're very concerned what other people think about them. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they, they try to say they're not like, oh, I really don't care what people think, but they really do. Yeah. Um, uh And this, this seems connected with the whirlwind. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, them trying to please people maybe, or, um, um, control how people see them in some way. Yeah. So, um, and who do these women envy secretly? Mm, good question. I, I don't Instagram know exactly. Influencers. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, <laughs> I, I can't think of like anybody specific other than somebody that they look at and maybe they think a, hey, they have it all together, which obviously we know nobody has it all together, but there's something about that person's vibe that just really connects to them. You know, it's almost that they're just more in what I would consider the flow of life. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's a big part of, they're just, they would see people in the flow of life. And once again, they're not sitting at their kitchen table saying, Oh, I just wish I was in the flow of life. But I believe that's almost like a desire of a feeling for them. Yeah. Well, this, the, the way, and you know, my, my guess is they might've read eat, pray, love and they're, you know, Oh, I want to do that. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Like, God, I would just love to run away from all of this or, but this is the type of thing we can start to articulate where you could, somebody says, well, yeah, what are you doing? You say, well, you know, there's a lot of women and they're just caught in this swirl of their life and it's, and they're so, um, uh, they're so busy all the time and they're not even happy with what they're busy with and things are starting to change in their life. And now they, and, and maybe, yeah, and they look at certain people and when we can get specific about these, like they look at these people going to Burning Man, or maybe it's, they look at, they want, they're ready, pray love and they just killed them, you know, or they, they see people who just move across the country or they yeah, just start a garden or they move to an eco. I don't know what it would be. But, you know, they see this kind of thing as so like, oh, my God, I want that. Mm-hmm. The, 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 you know, and I would think about for yourself, like, what did you crave? Who were you envying when you were in that situation? Who did you look at? Were there uh, authors or books or movies or um, ideally something that somebody would hear and say, oh, I know what that is, you know? Right, and, you right. Know, I, I looked at them and I just thought, oh, that's what I want. Uh, because my guess is a lot of them, they don't look at the 21 year old of Burning Man and say, I want to be that necessarily. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe, maybe there's something else um, that's, that's a little more true for where they're at. Um, or maybe they, they, they saw an older woman. It's like, oh my gosh, she's so comfortable in her skin. Mm-hmm. Like, wow, I want to be like her when I grow up. And that, and that was the thing that had them see how far away they were. Yeah. And so anyways, it's, um, it's, uh, here's the thing with niching. Uh, it's funny. So the, this, the home study program I have, it's a 90 day program because I tried to, uh, I used to spend like an hour or two in my workshops and I honestly thought that would be enough. And of course that was insane. And then I a whole, I'll do a whole day and, you know, and then two days, and that wasn't enough. And then I did a 30 day program and that wasn't enough. And 90 days seems to be about the sweet spot. The reason I bring it up is because the, there's something about niching where it seems to need to get messier before it gets tidier. Yeah. It's, you got to kind of pull everything apart. Like when I was a kid, there was this book I read and looking back, I think all parents must just worship the author of these books because it was a series of books of getting kids to do their chores, but it was like how you can tidy your room, but you know, drawn for kids. And I loved it. And, um, but the way they suggested that you tidy your room, they say, first you get everything off your bed and then you make your bed perfectly. Then you put everything in your room on the bed, you know, empty all the drawers, everything goes on the bed, Mm -hmm. you dust everything and then you put everything back. So that's what niching is like. 
you know, you, you, can, you get your blank piece of paper, you've made that, that's your bed that you're making. And then I'd like this conversation, ideas come out and it gets messy as hell. <laughs> and if you stop there, it's a disaster. Now it's worse than it was. It would have been better to just not get on this call and not share what you came up with. That would have been better because now it's worse. But if you keep sifting and eventually you put everything back, it's so much better. Mm-hmm. Um, so there is yeah. a, it's the messy middle. <laughs> it's the messy <laughs> middle. Yeah. It's like, it's like what we're looking for is the simplicity on the other side of complex kind of complexity. Right. Exactly. Um, but yeah, Tad, I, I, I just looking at the time and I want to uh, be sure we have a chance to talk about your course because people, oh, yeah. and by the way, Anne, is this helpful? Just at least, uh, oh, to get, gosh. Yeah. Extremely. Yeah. Okay. This is a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll, we'll obviously keep, keep working on this. Sure. Um, thank you. Yeah. So, so yeah, let's, let's take a few minutes and talk about um, if people are watching this and they're like, great. Okay. How do I get Tad support on this? Um, you've got this, you've got your, well, the, the website is nichingspiral.com. Right. And then you've, you've got a book on it and you've also got this 90 day program. So yeah. talk about that. Sure. Um, yeah, this was, I just only have so much time uh, to, to work with people one-on-one and it's such an in-depth something. And so I kept thinking this was for years. I thought I should turn, cause I had so much content. Um, I didn't know what to do with it. I had so many eBooks, so many things I'd written on this topic and I knew they'd be useful, but not as a just pile to give people. I thought I have to put together some of the structures of it in a really sequential way. And it's called the niching spiral because the biggest challenge I saw with, with niching is people saw it as a linear something from point A of no niche to point B of having a niche with a mysterious process in the middle. And then if the point B didn't work out, if the niche didn't work out, people thought they failed. And so, oh, well, I got to start again. Of course, you're not starting again. So this course is designed to take you through the spiral twice. One in a very quick and dirty broad way, and the second time through much more specific. Um, so this, yeah, this image you can see is the spiral seven steps that you're going to be taken through, looking at um, what is it you want to do, and just honing that. Why do you want to do it? Um, you know, what got you into this work? And you heard that even in this call. Uh, pretty much everyone I think who spoke had some personal story of some experience that has them wanted to do the work they're doing. Then uh, uh, how do you want to do it? You know, and uh, what's the point of view a little bit? What's the philosophy? What's the style or aesthetic you want to bring to it? Because that is part of the niche. And then you'll see these two who's there's what I call the big circle, the broad general sense of who do you want to work with? And then the three little circles, they're the, uh, uh, three target markets I encourage people to come up with uh, at a maximum. Then step six, you just experiment. You try something very small. And one of the things in this home study course is uh, there's a, a, a whole section around this niche experiment. There's Here's 50 different types of niche experiments you can do, tiny ways you can do it uh, to, to get some feedback quickly on your niche uh, so that you don't have to change your whole website and invest in a bunch when it's premature and then last you know, step is you reflect on it. Uh, also in this program, there's uh, there are a number of just meditations, visualizations you can do that can help uh, get you in touch with what the niche is. A ton of questions, very specific questions, and step by step, and also guide you to, first of all, build a little team who can give you honest, candid reflections on your niche, uh, and then some ex- exercises you can do where you do something, you get it good enough, and then you share it with your friends. So there's a mechanism built in. And there's, of course, there's a Facebook group where you could share uh, what you come up with with other people who are going through the same thing. If you want to work with me one-on-one as you go through it, you know, of course, there's options for that. But this is uh, over a decade of work and thinking about niching and trying to put it all into one place. Um, It's not quick because I think most people try to do the niching thing Uh, too quickly but this is very substantial by the end of this uh, I think you know very good chance you have a very workable profitable niche uh, that you can start moving with that you've done a lot of thinking about because every in in my mind every hour you spend thinking about niching learning about niching working on your niche 
saves you 10 hours, 100 hours down the road. Uh, so it's a lot of time, but well worth it. And to me, the, the big upside of this is at the end of this, you're going to be very fluent in this whole language of niching. You're going to have seen a ton, a ton, a ton of examples. There's also a whole niching vault in the home study program of dozens and dozens and dozens of niches. So you're going to be very uh, steeped in this understanding of niche so that even if you need to change your niche, even if you change businesses, you're going to have this understanding of niche that most of your um, uh, colleagues and you know uh, people in your community don't have. Uh, I just think this is probably one of the most important skills an entrepreneur can have is the capacity to, to uh, figure out, articulate, hone uh, their, their niche, you know, what they do, how they do it, for whom they do it. Yeah. And it's $300. Yeah. It's year. really affordable. I was going to say, um, yeah, I mean, this kind of stuff, people, I see people charge like $2,000 for. So um, yeah. thank you for, for offering it. That's such a good, good rate. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. And just the, the format of it generally is every day there's a video and a little PDF. Cool. Two or three minute video, quick exercise. So it take you 20, 30 minutes a day. Uh, if, if you just give me 90 days on your niche, and I think you'll be amazed at the progress. And then, of course, you can do a three pay $100 a month. They're the bonus ebooks that you'll get with this um, that can help deepen your understanding and give you more examples of these things. Uh, so those get thrown in. And uh, so, yeah, there you go. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, quick question before we end. Uh, Marina says, can you give a quick example of the three islands again, just so that? Yeah, sure. So, okay, so Island A could be this little town in Europe, and they were having sewage troubles. Uh, and it was a real big challenge because they'd been a small town, and all the sewage went through a canal. And when you're a tiny town, no problem. But suddenly the population boomed. And they've got just raw sewage and it's smelly and it's a health hazard and all this. So that's Island A. That's the trouble. Island B, that's what they're craving. That's the important thing. So they're craving, uh, we want a chemical treatment plant because that's all we know to want. Somebody else comes along and says, well, we can do this thing called living machines where they basically plant swamp reeds and flowers in the canal. And the canal goes all the way through town. So by the time it reached the ocean, the water's clean because the plants have cleaned it. You see what I'm saying? That's, they're not craving that. Nobody in that town was falling asleep saying, oh, it's so smelly, so terrible. If only we could cure this with flowers. How could we, you know, nobody's, it's not on anyone's mind. So it's. Um, so that would be Island C, right? That's, 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 exactly. That's, yeah, that's like, that's like the solution people haven't thought of. Um, yeah. but, but, but you could present it if you educate the population enough. Yeah. That's right. the Island C takes the education. Now, island A might be, um, uh, but yeah, I often say like, Island B is the menu that you get, you get at the restaurant, but Island C is there's sometimes a secret menu that, that's that right. restaurants have where it's, you, if you know to order it, they have it, but it's not on the menu and you have to be kind of in. So uh, I, there's a number of things that are Island C and it's just good to make the distinction that you still have to speak to Island A and Island B. Even if you're offering Island C, it's still, it's helpful. I mean, there's gotta be some context for it. It can't just be, Hey everyone put swamp reeds in water. It's wonderful. There, there's gotta be a context of, Hey, is, do you have polluted water? The right. Island A has to be named still. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, so Island A is the problem they're aware of. Island yep. B is uh, the, solution the solution they're aware of. Right. And then this Island C is like, you, you, you know, maybe it's something that you think is a much better solution, but they have to be on board with it. Right? They, have to yeah. buy it. they have to buy into that idea. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much, Tad. This has been uh, so helpful um, for those who are here and hopefully for those who are watching the video. Comment below um, what, you, what you think of this. I will put the link for the Niching Spiral course in um, in the notes of the video, uh, you know I, I believe in Tad's work so much that this is, you know I just I just wanted to share it with everyone. So um, if you liked what you saw today and you want to really get into your niche, get the course. Um, I promise you, Tad's work is top notch. So thank you, thank you so much, Tad. Appreciate all your all you do.
You're welcome. Just, one last thing I would say is yeah. there's something I do called puttering sessions where it's, you know, people can work with me for an hour and I've had some luck helping people with their niche on that. If you get the, the home study and we get to work on one-on-one even, even better. So mul- multiple options. Awesome. Awesome. Great. So uh, Tad, your website again is marketing for hippies.com and the niching spiral course is at niching spiral.com um course.nichingspiral.com but nichingspiral.com will get you there so check it out everybody and uh thank you thanks for being here and thanks tad and thanks to uh those of you who stepped up and and gave us examples for for thanks brave souls thank you thank you all right take care everybody everyone